Welcome everyone to my talk. This is going to be a fun talk, or at least for me. This is in a style of a really bad YouTube video like we see every day. So I'm just going to say it once, and I'm going to probably say it a few times. Don't forget to like and subscribe. But first, a word from our sponsor, Dollar VPN Club. Do you browse the internet and look at dollars and spend dollars without a VPN? Hackers could be stealing your dollars and doing nefarious things and selling them on the black market. Use code OWL for 20% off. Links in the description below. So let's talk about this uh, little device here that we got. So I, uh, I work for a company called Exodus. And one day, my manager came up to me and was like, hey, uh, we got this request for this Verizon thing. And I'm like, all right, cool. So this is the device. We looked it up. We got the SEC ID. What do we do when we get the SEC ID? We look online. We get the internal photos. And then we look at you know, the CPU right here with these two memory modules with that shield around it. And we look over here. And you might be thinking, well, what's this? That looks interesting. And so we get the device. We have this little shield thing on it, or a little heat sink. Take it off. And then we have these pads. And so this is 3.3 Logic. So I use an Arduino Nano, $5, put JTAG enum on it, and bit bang the things. And we got system reset, TDI, TMS, uh, test reset, ground, all that good stuff. And then also, we have some pre-populated pins in the middle of the board. Uh, we have ground, we have receive, transmit. So this is UART. <coughs> But the problem is when we, when we try to connect to UR and we have a, you know, it boots up, we don't have anything. Like, that sucks. They're like, damn it. So I'm like, all right, well, let's, let's go back. We have that JTAG interface, right? So we just you know, put some pins on it. We use some electrical tape to cover up all my nasty soldering stuff and make it look kind of pretty. And then also I have a new device where I did the same thing as well. Uh, we connect it up with some wires. <clears throat> And we open open an OCD. We have our interface card, which is a FTDI 2232H. Uh, it's a two port uh, 232. And so we get the ID from it. So we do have a JTAG interface. Uh, that particular ID, I couldn't find it inside the target directory of OpenOCD. There wasn't any pre configured configuration for it. So I look at the manual and figure out what everything is. And it was pretty simple. We just had to define the reset. We have to tell the board how to reset the device, like where system reset is, if we have test reset or not. Is it a push pull? Is it a tri state, et cetera? Uh, then we have the JTAG interface. And then the very last thing is that we we're just going to have a Cortex A little Indian processor. And then once we put those two configurations together, we have JTAG. Awesome. So the first thing that I did was you, know, you connect to OpenOCD with Telnet, uh, reset the device, and then halt it. And all I did over and over again was I used GDB to open OpenOCD open just to dump memory over and over and over. But once I saw on UART that the devi device was starting to boot into Linux. Um, so this is past <clears throat> the U-boot process. And now it's going to be loading up Linux. And I just did this for about hours. And so I looked around inside the dump, and I looked for like a net equals. We have one, we have two, we have three, we have four. I'm like, this is too much. Like, there's probably like 12 of them all over the place. And I was like, well, how about we just look at the very first one, we look at the very last character offset, and we set a watch point. We'll set a watch point at that address for when something's written to or access or anything else like that. So we halted. Uh, I did resume it in GDB, and I typed resume in Telnet, so that's why we got the warning. But either way, the watch point does hit at the very bottom. And you'll see that um, once I print out the string, that string is being written to. And if I dumped more memory stuff in that same address space, it'd be all nulls. So all I did was I just, re <laughs> I just overwrote that uh, uh, kernel boot parameter stuff. And instead of doing slash init, just slash bin sh, let it run. And we got a, we got a root shell on the bottom now. Like, this is awesome. This is fantastic. So now we just have to boot up the device. Um, and then we have to look at all like, you know, the uh, user land applications. The lowest, uh, the easiest way first, path of least resistance, right? Um, I can always go into the kernel, look at kernel modules, et cetera. But I want to start easy. I want to see what's listening on all interfaces, what's listening on internal interfaces, and stuff like that. We do some, have some uh, services that are listening on every single port. But uh, there's IP tables uh, rules that will not allow us to get to it. They're supposed to be on loopback only. But we'll get to that in a minute, because we can still hit it. So I'm looking through, and the very first thing, like easy peasy, like everyone talks about it. This is SSDP. It's part of UPnP. It runs on multicast. Awesome. So uh, there's three UPnP services inside this Verizon router. Um, so the very first thing, like we're not going to go through the Frontier 4 or mini UPnP today. Uh, but what we're going to look at is WPS Monitor. And so 
the very first thing when I'm starting to look at a device is I need to know my environment. If I'm going to start looking for bugs, like I need to think if like if ASLR is on, I'm probably going to have to do some sort of info leak, whether a read out of bounds or an uninitialized object, whatever. So the very first thing was that you know you you just cat the <laughs> the maps and. I saw the UPnP library here. It could be something else. Um, I know it says libupnp. It is not the Intel libupnp library. It's something completely different. And we have ASLR and the imported libraries. And the stack in the heap, we do have depth. And also, this, the heap address does change upon every single reboot or once the application is started again. So ASLR does impact the base address of the heap. Cool. So also, the last thing is that this is not compiled with Pi. So this, is, this could be used as a gadget. But the problem is we have those null bytes in the base address. So if we have a string-based buffer overflow, we're not going to be able to use this as any gadgets, because null bytes will stop a string talk be right? So the last thing I did, too, is you type mount, and you want to see the root, like which one is the root directory. And this dev was the ubi0 underscore 0. It has a USB port in the back here. So I just dumped it to a file, plug in USB, just dumped it. And that's how I got the firmware. And you just bin walk it. Super technical, I know. So um, let's go into the next part, the vuln hunting stuff. So I got all the binaries out, and I have the WPS binary, and I have the libupnp library. So I throw the libupnp library into IDA. And before we go any further, this technique I'm going to show you guys is very advanced, super advanced. Like This is going to blow symbolic execution out of the water or anything that you have. I look for percent %s in the strings. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> The very first thing that I saw was uh, like this HP 200 OK, where there's a percent %s here, there's a percent %s over there, there's one over there too, and just one more for good luck, and just maybe just one more, just one more. Like who the hell wants to do a percent %d or float? Just make everything a string and be happy with it, right? So I'm like, what is this response being constructed by? Or how is it? Is it just like, you know, what, what's, what's generating it? And I know, I know, you're probably going to be looking at this, and you see this sprint def, and you're probably going to be thinking, but that's OK. Um, this <laughs> so we have a sprint of, I know this is super like basic. I know this is, what is this baby o'clock stuff? But this is embedded, like, you know, this is the easy peasy stuff. So I'm looking for the, um, the destination, and I see that it's some sort of member of a struct. Like, I don't know if this is like, you know, where they do like a Sterling and that uh, character buffer is at the very end and they allocate the space needed in order to copy into it. I don't know if this is being used incorrectly or correctly. I don't know if this is static or dynamic yet. So the first thing I did was I pulled up the UPnP spec, because that's what every developer is going to be using is a spec of some sort. So this 200 OK comes from what's known as a subscription. So this subscription is part of the Gina stack of the UPnP library. And at the very end, I'm going to be discussing like more about this and like you know either way. Sorry. Um, so this particular thing, you see the subscription publish your path, and then you need a callback, which is going to be an HTTP URL that's going to be wrapped around angle brackets. I know this is NT, which it has to be UPnP event, and then you have this timeout second dash, and then some sort of integer, or you can put infinite to have a subscription last forever. So that particular publisher path is part of the event sub URL. It's right below the SOAP stuff, where everyone's like, oh, there's a control URL, send a pose, and do all the SOAP actions. Woo. No. So we're just going to be looking at the Gina stack, which is like general eventing something architecture. I forgot the top of my head. So the first thing I did was I opened up VS Code. You can use Vim. You can use Emacs. You can use Nano. I don't care. You can even echo it to a file. Who cares? So I decided to make a quick POC, because I wanted to see if this was even like reachable. So if I send a string of like my little handle thing for the second thing, I should get that same string back based on that percent %s I saw inside that response. So we send it, and we get this. Awesome. And this is supposed to be playing Windows XP's ta-da sound, but it's not doing it. So either way, so now I have you know, some sort of like string based, like it could be an overflow. I have some sort of control over the response of this based on what I can send to it. So there's two ways I can think of this. I'm under a time crunch. Like the faster the better, the sooner the better. I can't really spend too much time on this because where I work, a bug is not a bug until an exploit is written for it. Get code exec or get the hell out because we don't care about it. So I can do the super scientific way of trying to reverse this structure, define everything in structs, and make it all pretty. Or I can just black box it. I have runtime stuff, right? And that's what I ended up doing. But if we look online, I didn't have this at the time. This could be a leaked source 
of the UPnP library, and it has the pound defines of this particular structure, the buffer and all that stuff. And like I said, we can always go through and try to figure out the, uh, the structure for this. But I didn't do that at the time. I just black boxed it. Kobe. So anyways, <coughs> I set up a script that would just send a request. If we got a request, uh, uh, you know, a thing back and the socket was still up, that means nothing happened. So, you know, add a new character and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. And then, whoa, right? Uh, I was getting all excited. I'm like, oh, this is going to be awesome. My boss is going to be a high five. You know, like, this is going to be amazing. Shit. Like, this doesn't look good. Like, it's just load, compare, zero, load to another thing, and then it returns. Then after that, it doesn't really do much else with the structure that is clobbered. So I'm like, all right, let's, let's, uh, let's go back to this drawing board here. Like, ugh. I, I need to uh, figure this out. So we look back at the, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the paper, oh, what was this, the, uh, the spec, sorry. And we see something about renewing subscriptions. So when you send a subscription, the device will send you something called a SID, or a subscription identifier. You can update your timeout value. So if you said, I want to subscribe to this particular like, area of the UPnP uh, for 30 seconds, it will do that, but you're like, no, 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 no I messed up. I want, actually want to do 120 seconds. You just send a subscribe with just the SID and a new timeout value, and it will update that. So I was like, well, let's do this. Let's subscribe. Let's get the SID, and then we'll just start updating the timeout value over and over again. And so <clears throat> I don't even know why that was there. So either way, I do this, and I see a different place of psych fault. I'm like, oh, 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 ooh, this is nice. And I'm like, what's, what's R3? Like, what's the value of that? Oh, that's my name. That's crazy. That's awesome. So I'm one pointer away now from like, getting PC control. Again, just getting PC control doesn't mean anything for us. We have to get code execution. But this is actually seems promising now. So we can kind of get PC control. We're one pointer away. We can't use WPS Monitor as a gadget yet because we have null bytes in the base address. And this is a string-based overflow. And also, ASLR is in, on the imported libraries, and I don't have a read out of bounds. So let's get into the exploit development part of it. So I started thinking about this. I'm like, one pointer away, you know, like, what does this remind me of? Like, it reminds me of, it reminds me of IE. This is supposed to be playing the Windows XP startup sound. But this reminds me of IE exploitation days, where you're like, I'm going to instantiate this ActiveX -like module, doesn't have ASLR on it, and then I'm going to spray the heap, and I'm going to you know, stack pivot and do all this crazy stuff. So I was like, well, let me change my technique here. Like, what if I can find primitives to spray the heap and then maybe do some magic because I still have to get around the bad byte stuff. I need to use WPS Monitor as a gadget unless I can read out of bounds. And then maybe we can trigger the overflow and get code exec. So the first thing I wanted to do was kind of get an idea of this base address for the heap. Like, how high and how low does it load? Because um, I need to set, like, a target. Um, if I'm going to spray the heap and use that technique in order to get code execution. So I ran it once, rebooted it, ran it again, rebooted it, and again, and again, and again, and one more time, just one more, I swear. Okay, just one, just one more, just last one. So either way, I <laughs> you get the idea. I ended up having a list of like what's my high, what's my low, and everything else, because I need to know what I can actually hit. Like if I go for 020202, that's not going to be a good place because it actually loads into that area at times. But we also have 118 megs free. So if theoretically, we can always like go up to like 06, 06, 06, 06, 06, if assuming that the base address of the heap is always 0. So I'm like, all right. So the base address, uh, my whole list and everything else, there was nothing above 020202. So I'm like, let's go for 030303. So let's, let's do that. So now I've got to start looking at primitives. So when you send a subscription, that callback uh, header, which wrapped around an angle bracket to, you know, HP slash slash some IP address colon port slash to URI, end it with an angle bracket. Um, this is going to take a Sterling uh, from the first, from the, the slash all the way to the URL that you, that you send. And it's going to Sterling it, and it's going to add it to the size of some struct, and it's going to calc it. Like, great. Like, I saw calc, I was like, damn it. Like, it's going to mem set it. Like, all right, whatever. So I can use this probably to spray the heap or grow the heap, especially since. Um, with, uh, we'll get into it. <laughs> so anyway, I end up um, going into GDB, setting up my GDB breakpoints, and I was like, all right, let's just try subscribing, 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 and see what happens. And I, we got the same address, same address, same address, same address, same address. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, what the hell is going on? So I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, 
if I send the same IP, same port, or same URI, there's no reason to allocate a new thing. It probably is going to free and just update it. So I was like, well, let me change like the port number. Like, let me do a for loop, and I'll just use the I, uh, you know, the uh, the iterable just for the port number. So I'll subscribe port one. The next, the next one's gonna be port two, three, four, five, etc. Right? And I start seeing this. I'm like, oh, something's actually happening now. And so I started to wait a little bit. And so we see that the heap just keeps growing and growing and growing. So great, I actually have one primitive now. So I do a subscription, update, you know, increase the port number, subscribe, 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 blah, 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 blah. And so we're, we're now able to fill the heap as much as we want. We can actually run out of memory if we wanted to. So this is amazing, right? So we only have one primitive, though. We can grow the heap. We still need to do some magic because we're still bounded by the limitations of a string. We're using Sterling and stuff. Strings everywhere, like Jesus. So I'm like, all right, let's look at the spec now. And there's this other method called unsubscribe. And so um, when you send a subscription, you get your SID. If you decide you don't want to be subscribed anymore to that particular service, you can send an unsubscribe with your subscription identifier. And when you look at the code, it sounds like it's probably going to go free, and it does. It takes that block that you have, and it's going to pass it to free. So now we have the ability to kind of like allocate chunks and free chunks at will. And so I also like you know, set up a breakpoint. I just want to make sure that this is happening. And so when I did the subscriptions, I just flipped the array and started going from the top to the bottom. And we can see the 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. So my 4K chunks are being freed. So OK, going back to monkeying around and trying to figure stuff out, because this is starting to come together a little bit, I ended up pulling in a coworker because I was like, I can free chunks, I can allocate chunks, but I'm still bounded by a string. I need to get around that if I'm going to use WPS Monitor. So my coworker came in and was like, hey, there's this function about type length value B64 decoding. It's using malloc. Like, and then it frees it afterwards once the connection is lost. What do you think that's about? So I looked at SOAP. I know, SOAP. Everyone talks about it. And I saw these um, different actions, like delete AP settings. And this name, the, uh, the type of it is at the very bottom is AP settings. And it's a base64 string. I'm like, oh. So now. Um, when, I, when I tested this out, I sent just a you know, uh, SOAP request to that particular action. I have a base64 string of just like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you know, 0, 0, you know, just a bunch of stuff to see if I can actually get anything into that same block. And it does. It will allocate to that same chunk, decode it, and then free it. So now I can free a chunk occupy it. I can free a chunk, put that on the top in the free list of the 4K bucket, and free it and keep doing going. And so I look at the contents of this, and you can see, I, when I was working on this, you got O2s, O3s, and we have some like you know gadgets I started putting in. But I wanted to make sure that everything was lining up correctly, and I can use like nulls, which I can. And so this is, this is great. So we can spray the heap now. We can deallocate, deallocate chunks at will. We can get around the, the character restrictions now by using that base64 soap action thing. But we still need to do some stuff. So when I was working on this, I was going for 0202 originally. And so when I would do the whole stuff and I would break GDB, um, I would try to look at that memory space and like, that, what the hell is going on? So I started thinking about it. And I'm like, well, you can't build a roof or a house without a roof, right? So what I was doing was I have all these subscriptions. And I would free it, and I would occupy it. Free it, and I would occupy it, and free it, and occupy it. And you see, you get the idea of where this is going. So when this is all free now, the Linux kernel is going to come in and just start reclaiming memory back that it provided me. So now I have a race condition, but I can't have that because I'm over a socket. There's no guarantee I'm going to win the race. So what if I just leave the last subscription there? It's always going to be busy. It's always going to be occupied. And that's actually worked. So the Linux kernel won't come back and reclaim that memory now. So now I can just keep going and keep going and just leave the last one up there as just a roof. And like I said before, the timeout value of the subscription, um, if it reaches 0, it will free it. That's the other thing that will happen as well. So this roof that I have, instead of putting like a large integer, you can use the word infinite. It will never count down to zero. It will never be freed unless you specifically request it to be freed. So now I can keep going down the list, and now I have this like big pool that I can start playing around with. 
But when I was doing this, it would work and work for a while. But the, beast, the base 64 malloc stuff was returning back the same address for a while. And I was like, oh, what is going on? So I ended up just like breaking on free, trying to see everything that's going on. And so if you have Chrome open, it likes to send out SSDP packets because it's trying to look for a TV. It's using something called Dial, um, which is a Netflix spec. But you can look it up. You can look at the Chromium source code for that. But either way, sending an SSDP packet on multicast does cause some sort of allocation. And also, uh, connecting on TCP and sending any sort of data allocates some objects in the heap as well. So I'm like, all right. So what I wanted to do was try to spam the top of the free list as much as I could. This does increase the time it takes to exploit the device, but I'm guaranteed now or have a higher likely chance of always uh, you know, filling these chunks instead of just freeing it and it's just full of like a string, like DDDDD -D 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 or whatever, right? So now I'm doing the same thing over and over, but what I do instead is that I would free five, reoccupy it, and then I would free it again, and I would do this. And this guaranteed, or had a higher chance that that sort of like you know issue that I was having, where I was getting the same address over and over again, doesn't happen anymore. So we can spray the heap. We can do some magic now. We're not quite like you know Chris Angel stuff, mind freaks yet, but uh, we still need to dev this exploit chain because remember, it's not a vuln unless an exploit is written for it. So again, here's me trying to think about it. And so I was like, well, what do I have control over upon the crash? Like when I do the crash, what registers or what buffers do I have control over? We see the R3, um, and we see, I look at R4, and this is going to be like my overflow stuff. And so I was thinking, and I was like, well, you know, back to IE stuff, what if we do a stack pivot? And I was like thinking, this is, a, uh, this is an ARM v7 32-bit processor. And so I found this old slide about this uh, load multiple decrement before. And so it was like, oh, you can do a stack pivot with this. And so I loaded up Redare and tried to look for gadgets, for these thumb gadgets, because I can control whether what mode I'm in, because I have a branch, branch linking exchange um, instruction. So I saw all of these, and I tried it. And nope, we have an illegal instruction. And I looked up inside the R manual, and we see that for this particular instruction stuff, inside the reg list, SP cannot be in there. <clears throat> so I can't, <clears throat> hold on. Ah, so I can't use this as a gadget. I can't stack pivot with this, and it was depressing. So what I ended up doing instead was I spent about a good week or two, just oh, it was probably a good week, just manually searching for gadgets by hand and Ida and Radar as well. And this is what I came up with. So gadget one, all this does, since R4, I have control over the contents of it. So we deref R4, and now we're inside that buffer. And now we have stuff that I control. So if I put R4 into R3, and then R3 gets added, and it derefs those things, I can call something with two arguments. Then after that, I was like, well, this is only a one-shot thing. If I you know, do this, like. Uh, it's not going to return. If it returns, it's going to pop it off the stack, and I lose. Like, this is a one-type thing. So I looked, I looked around. I was like, I need something without character restrictions. So I found this mem copy, <clears throat> where long story short, the destination at the very bottom is a stack-based buffer, and I control the length, and I control the source of this particular uh, mem copy. So instead of trying to bring the stack pointer to the heap, I'll bring the heap to the stack. So I end up smashing the stack, but at the very end, it's a very large stack frame. And I'm getting towards the end of it. <clears throat> so I need to be careful. So I'll start looking around. And so like, what I do from here, too, is because um, what I do next is that I need to call some sort of libc functions, either mprotect or system or popen or something. Um, but these, these, um, <laughs> these functions are not imported inside WPS Monitor. So what I need to do is I need to find another function that I can deref into libc and add the offset to get to the function I'm trying to get to. So R7 is going to be pointing to the um, <coughs> import address table for stir to, stir to unsigned long. And that's going to put that into R0 and I'm going to pop stuff off the stack. I put, well, let me get my notes here. God. <laughs> so now I deref the import address table plus four. So 
I take the address table offset and the minus four, so when it adds four, it goes into sort of unsigned long, and <coughs> we, we load that into R0. And then we keep going, and then now R3 is going to contain an offset. So I can add the offset now to the start the unsigned long, because we're inside libc now, and I can get to system, I can get the p open, I can get to whatever the hell I want. And then from there we pop R4. And so the last one here, all I'm doing is I'm saving that new calculated address to somewhere in the heap. We already copied everything from the heap to the stack. So I can do whatever the hell I want to the heap now. It's not sensitive anymore. So all this is doing now is just saving a pointer to the heap. That's all this is going to do for me. And then I'm going to use gadget 1 again, because that gives me the ability to call anything with two arguments. So I end up using, I tried using system originally, since it only takes one argument. But I was, it, it was crashing for some reason. I think it was running out of static space or whatever. But popen, for some reason, worked fine. So I was like, I'll just use popen, where you know, I'll put, this, put the command, and then I'll put like a read value. So great. So let's put it all together. So the first thing I want to do is that um, if I'm going to subscribe and try to you know, fill up the heap as much as I can, what if there's other subscriptions in there? Like That, that would fuck us up. So what I want to do, what I did was, I was looking at the subscription IDs, and they're linear. Once you subscribe, it just adds one and sends you to that one. So adds another one, adds another one. So if I subscribe, and I take that UID, or UUID, and it's just like minus like 100, that will, be, that will get rid of the last 100 subscriptions, since this is a linear, it gives me a linear number. And then afterwards, I can start spraying the heap, and then I can save all the subscription identifiers, I'm not going to free the very last one, since that's going to be my roof. So the Linux kernel doesn't reclaim memory. Then after that, I'm going to do the free and replace uh, with my fake struct, ROP chain, and the command inside of it as well, where we free five, reoccupy five, free them again, and then we keep going to the next five. <clears throat> it does add a lot of time, but I'm it gives me a higher probability that those chunks will be occupied with the B64 decoded string. So we just keep going, going, going. We also want to watch for multicast traffic. So I have, a multi I have a UDP listener, and all I do is I select the socket. If there's something to read, we read it all in, and then we try to like, you know, we just do the same thing. We're going up and down just to make sure nothing's in there that we don't want in there. <coughs> then maybe we can trigger the vuln, and we win. So like when I'm doing the Metasploit module, this is what it's going to start off with. Like the very last one was the two that I got, and it was just like minus like whatever, in order to try to you know get everyone unsubscribed so I can have the heap to myself. And then maybe, maybe if you're like me and you like staying up late and you like to get anxious, maybe last night at 4 a.m. I might have you know done this exploit just to make sure I get everything's working, and there, it, it works. So I. Hold on, Let me, let's see here, because one thing I noticed, because I was troubleshooting this earlier, I've ran this exploit many, many times at my house, my, my work, uh, people's, you know, at buildings or whatever, but at conferences, something happens and it hit me today. People's phones are trying to connect to this fucking thing and it keeps hitting up the heap adders and it's allocating stuff on the WPS stuff. And I was like, ugh, stop it, guys. Like, ugh, you're messing my stuff up. So we are at, hold on one second, let me see if I can pull this over here. So we're at 91%. I'm willing to wager $0 of my money, because I don't really have any. Uh, it's probably going to fail or something, just because of all the phones connected and such. But just in case this fails, it's going to take another about three minutes uh, to finally do this. The exploit takes 30 minutes. <laughs> it's so slow and boring. Um, but let's look at like a video. So like last night. Uh, so this is about 4 a.m. this morning, and I'm looking, looking, like, come on, buddy. Come on, buddy. You better fucking work, I swear to God. And so I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, and you can see, like, <laughs> I had to use my Arduino as a serial adapter because I forgot a cable. But either way, oh, my God, it worked. Oh, wait, hold on. And then, just as a bonus video, this was about an hour ago. Ah, come on. So this is about one hour ago. I was in the corner right back there by the table, and I was like, come on, buddy. And I had to modify my heap target because everyone's phone keeps trying to mess with my exploit. 
Stop it, guys. God. But either way, I was all excited, and I was so super excited about that. And also, just a, you know, a small thing, and holding a camera and trying to type at the same time is very difficult. So we look at the session, and we type shell. And if anyone can guess what permissions I have, we have root permissions. It wouldn't be embedded if there wasn't some sort of, if, if everything had to be ran as root. It wouldn't be embedded at this point. So either way, this is amazing. And let's go back to the real exploit. I bet it failed. Oh, it's at 98% now. So the last thing I wanted to do was all of this like manual looking, the uh, static analysis stuff is very time consuming, and it takes way too long to do. So I ended up writing a simple test case suite with just vanilla Python 3. Nothing, you know, I, no pip install, anything else. Just requests, the XML parser, and maybe B64 and some other things. And <laughs> it failed. <laughs> like, yeah, you, you, uh, your phone is messing up my exploits. That's OK. I'm glad I took a video of it. Um, so I ended up writing this little like fuzzer where I call, I call it fuzzy UPnP. And so we can, um, <clears throat> let me go ahead and reboot this device here. Actually, no, let's not reboot this device. This is an old device, actually. So this is from, get out. So I, I drilled a hole. But anyways, this device was about three years old. And so I decided to go online. And you know, I'm a Fios customer now. You know, I have fiber optic, even though I, I, usually, I have like dial-up, basically. But I ended up getting a brand new one. Oh, is that nice, Verizon? That's awesome. So let's boot up this device now. And let's, uh, let's do one thing with it, too. So the other device, I modify the, um, <coughs> the boot arguments upon boot up to go into uh, bin sh, so which means I had to use serial in order to launch the init scripts and all that stuff to get the whole thing brought up. This is not modified like that. I didn't do that. So this is going to boot up just naturally just fine. And so this takes about maybe like five minutes to boot up. And wow, I'm making great time. All right. So the one <laughs> what I wanted to show is uh, the little fuzzy UPnP thing that I wrote. And I'm going to be opening up Tmux real quick. And I'm going to go into offensive con, fuzz. All right. Uh, ch -ch -ch. Uh, so I don't have an IP address yet. All right. So I'm going to wait to get an IP address. And let me, let me continue on with the talk. We'll come back to the demo of the, the whole fuzzy stuff, because it makes my life a lot easier. Because I've looked at so many UPnP services. I know it's a dead horse. Many people beat on it. Um, but I just wanted to write it for myself, because I'm, I'm getting lazier. I'm getting older. My hair's fucking falling out. Like I don't want to keep looking at stuff anymore by hand. It's good to do it by hand to get the logic down. But once you have the logic down by hand, it's better just to automate it. And also, like, have some, the biggest one was getting, making validators for my test cases. What marks as a pass, what marks as a fail, and what marks as suspicious. So it took a lot of time of just like manually going through and also downloading media UPnPD and modifying everything so I can make the test cases work for what I'm looking for. Like, I'll put a string overflow inside of a soap action or something, or a command injection. So like my command injection test cases, I'm doing a ping, and I just have an ICMP listener. And if I get four ping packets back, that's so something suspicious. Um, maybe there's a command injection in that particular area. So anyways, let's get back to the uh, thing. So we'll get back to the fuzzy stuff in a little bit. <coughs> so I was going to do the demo. We'll come back to this. But this talk isn't about how I found a vuln and I exploited it. I could have just written a blog post about that. Like that, Who cares, right? But the one thing I wanted to show is that, uh, whoop, one second, <clears throat> is that after my last talk, someone found a vuln inside D-Link. I've known about this vuln for a while. It was inside our Exodus feed since uh, early 2018. But this, uh, and this impacted a lot of devices. This is inside the Gina stack, that subscription thing that I just talked about. It's, it, impacted a lot of devices. And it was just a simple command injection. The POC is simple. Subscribe that URL. Inside that URL, you can do a question mark service equals, and it just takes it and passes it to the system. Like, whoa, what? That's an awesome feature, D-Link. Awesome. And then also, there was another bug, but they patched it um, in line with this one, was that that callback, 
the URL also had a command injection vuln. So if they only patched one, you could go to the callback, but unfortunately they did patch both. But also, like I was saying, like this, this particular bug, like maybe some of you are thinking like, well, why didn't you disclose this bug to Verizon? Like, you know, you should be responsible. Uh, no, but this, this, but that doesn't do anything. Like, this doesn't do anything for this particular service. It's not a Verizon issue. It's a Broadcom issue. So when I started looking around, I noticed something. Um, if you look at Wikidev and you start looking up the Broadcom chips for the North Star type, um, you can find a lot of devices, like a lot, like 4, 12, 21, 26. There's a lot of devices. Like maybe this little thing right here, right? And, or maybe this little Asus router that I'm looking at right down here too. Um, like this is a T-Mobile TMAC1900. Um, and also just to give you guys just a quick, uh, I guess zero day, I guess. Um, the UART on this is disabled. JTAG on this is disabled as well. And there's this network tool. Hold on, I know what you're thinking, but hold on. <laughs> hold on. This does execute system commands, but this has been patched before. So we have this CVE 2018-9285. You know, so if you try to use backtick, semicolon, uh, quote, double quote, anything like that, uh, dollar sign, open parens, it filters all that stuff out. But it's inside of a post request inside the, uh, inside the path. What you can do is that you can inject new lines, percent OA, and you can get code execution from that. So if you want to use this particular bug, like go in here, you know, maybe use burp or use any sort of proxy in the middle that you can intercept traffic with and modify it. And just instead of using backticks or semicolon, just do percent away. And also, um, it does filter out the HTTP colon slash slash. But inside the ASUS router, um, wget doesn't require a URI handler. So you can do wget space 192.160, blah, blah, blah. And you can get code execution from this. But what I did was like, I did like percent away, and then like CD temp percent away, and then wget blah, 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 percent away. And then I, at the very end, I also, and then it just executed, yeah. So you can use this to get debugging capabilities. This is the only reason I'm disclosing this, because that's the only way I was able to get debugging capabilities on this without trying to rip it all out. It's using NAND flash, and I hate trying to get NAND flash extracts, because I always screw it up. But either way, maybe there's more bugs in it. I don't know. So either way, uh, just for the small ending, and then we'll go back to the fuzzy stuff. So I'm Black Owl. Um, I work at Access Intelligence. All right. <laughs> I, <laughs> I focus mostly on embedded devices, whether they be networking devices, smart stuff. Oh, speaking of smart stuff, Belkin Wemo. Uh, inside that libumpp library, there is a bug inside of it. It's using an old Intel UPMP library, and there's a bug in it when it's parsing the callback. If you have like two open angle brackets and only one uh, inside your callback URL, it will allocate one object, but it will try to fulfill for two. So you can start to write out of bounds. You just need something adjacent to it in order to make it work. But I showed you how to allocate chunks in free at will. It works for most libraries as well. So you can use that and get code exec on those Belkin Wemos as well. So before I end all this, <coughs> I just wanted to show my little fuzzy tool. So uh, ch -ch -ch. let me make sure I got an address first. So for this particular demo, I did disable um, my, here, clear all that, come on. <laughs> Uh, I can't even see that. All right, one second. <laughs> let's make it, let's, let's enhance, no, enhance, 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 enhance. All right, um, what was my address again? Jeez, and I'm gonna use IP address because IF config was deprecated. Um, <laughs> so I'm 1.159, right? So let's let's do this. So what, all I, all I use for my UPnP fuzzy stuff is one and two, 192, 168, 1152, right? 152? 159. I can't count today. So also, I do have another argument. So like one thing that happens a lot was when I'm fuzzing soap actions, it sucks to hit the same uh, soap action over and over again, because all I'm doing is just iterating, iterating, iterating. So I, did have, I do have a blacklist option. So I can skip over um, 
you know, services or whatever that are vulnerable, and I just keep going. So this is my little, my little script. There's no, it's not a script unless you print ASCII art, right? So I have two versions of this. This is the server one for UPnP servers, and I have one for clients. And it's funny, because with my client one, whenever I go into the office, I can tell exactly who's on YouTube, whether it be a phone, whether it be on the computer. Because when you open YouTube on Chrome, it sends out M search requests. And I spin up my fake dial server. And look, we already got one crash. Hold on. Uh, uh. All right. So when it finds the crash, and the way I have this like crash validators is just by, I, I use my old, like, uh, you know, I used to work in IT. I used to work at a knock back in the day. And uh, I used to have to set up these like local load balancers. And when you're setting up a server farm, the one thing you have to set up is a health check, right? You don't want a server in rotation that's malfunctioning. You can do a layer three health check, or a layer four health check, or you can do a layer seven. So this particular one, whenever I'm setting something and I get a reset, I do a layer three health, or layer four health check, actually, just to make sure the socket is still up. And then also, we have a possible info leak. So this one's using mini UPnPD. This bug is patched in mainline, but there were devices, and recently, I think a few months ago, finally Google Chrome did update, and it's not vulnerable to this read out of bounds anymore. But you can leak <laughs> as much data as you want with this particular bug. The bug, in, in a nutshell, was that they're using smprintf to uh, limit the copy when it's making the response and notification request, or when it's going to connect back to you and say, OK, notify slash and URL. It, it used smprintf to limit the copy. But it used a return value and passed that to send as a length parameter. smprintf will return the bytes that it could have copied, not how much it did copy. So we have a clamped copy, and we have an end parameter that's much larger than what we allocated. So this is a read out of bounds. You can use it to leak you know, uh, pointers. You can do the same thing where you're subscribing, unsubscribing, putting holes everywhere. And you can leak those structures easily. Um, I just couldn't get code exact. I couldn't find memory corruption. And you know what's frustrating? When you find a memory leak and no memory corruption to use it with, that is, oh, man, uh, sucks. But either way, um, we'll just keep going on it. but. It, this is great. Like, it took me maybe like a month to write. I'm thinking about maybe releasing it, but the test cases that I wrote took me a while. And it was just from experience of like, you know, what have I seen a lot? And also looking at the spec and being like, what could someone fuck up? Because usually, like, I've worked with developers in the past, and usually it comes down to crunching, like time crunching. And you just got to get something that works. And it passes your test case validators. And you just need it out the door, because your project manager is on your ass, then your, your manager on your ass, and that TPS report guy's on your ass. And you just don't want to deal with it anymore. So I'm, you know, I'm looking for stuff that's like string-based, using numbers. You know, the one thing that's fun about the timeout stuff, you can use negative numbers in some of them. And <laughs> before it's done, it's freed. But unfortunately, there was no use after freeze that I found. So let's see here. Let's keep going. And this is on the brand new device. So this is great for me whenever I'm like starting to look at a new router that has UPnP, or I'm looking at a smart switch, smart whatever. It's not really that smart, but it is convenient for those that are like you know uh, maybe had surgery or something. I had knee surgery, and I always thought smart lights and smart plugs were stupid until I couldn't get out of bed to turn off the damn light. I wish I had the damn clapper at the time. But either way, sorry, small rant. Um, We'll keep going. It's going about to end soon. It's going through all three of the UPnP services. The logic is pretty simple. Send out M search requests on the network that you want to be on, get all the responses, and start parsing the XML. Just be careful. If you're going to start writing this yourself as well, just for fun, Belkin, why do you do this? You have malformed XMLs. I had to put so many <laughs> little patches in my little code to keep going and make it fine. But either way, and then we have an Oh, another possible info leak. Is this just going over and over again? Hmm. Or maybe there's two. Ooh, what if there's another one? Either way, let's just stop this for now, because it'll just keep going. I also disabled the, um, the sounds I had on them before, because at the very end, it usually goes, damn, son, where'd you find these? But, <laughs> but at the very end of it, we have all these different pocs. And I can go through all these different ones. So if I go through maybe the first one, come on. We see this, and then I'm in Tmux. Don't worry. I know how to use Tmux, kind of. This is the bug that I found statically. Instead of spending a day or two doing what I did, 
I can now find it in 10 seconds. This is fantastic. And I don't even need to talk to this about you guys, because I know all of you do this. But this was just fun for me, and I thought it was a great thing to talk about and share a little bit. But, um, and also, the, like, the InfoLeak stuff, like, uh, da -da 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 -da. which one is it? IPCon. Oh, I know why. So I have multiple info leaks because there's multiple services, but the Gina stack is still stays the same. So this was in mini UPMPD as well. And as you can see, there's the callback URL, where the second is set to a random number, you know. Um, and the callback is the HTTP colon slash slash the IP address, and you have all these things. One thing that's also used for this, useful about this is that you can use this service as a, a server-side request forgery. There was services, TCP listeners, that will only connect to loopback or had IP, IP table filters to not let anything external to talk to this. I can use this now to say 127.001, the port number I'm trying to do. And if that particular service was using tokens like stircher, and it'll start here, and then it's going to do a stircher or something like that and start parsing, and maybe like there's a command injection, maybe there's an overflow or something, I can use this as just a pivot. So this is great. Like, and also, I guess you could use it as a DDoS, but come on, get out of here with that. So um, at the very, so that's, I'm about to wrap up my talk now. We have about 14 minutes left. So I just wanted to say one more time, don't forget to like, don't, hit, don't forget to like and subscribe, hit that notification bell. And if you haven't already, visit the link in the description below. Thank you so much, guys. I'm Black Owl, and I'll say good night. If there's any questions, let me just have this first. <laughs> uh, are there any questions? Comments? Concerns? All right, that's fine. All right, thank you again.